We'd like to welcome you to the African American Film Critics Association Virtual Roundtable. We are so pleased today to be joined by P Valley All Stars, Mr. Nico Anon, who plays Uncle Clifford, the fantabulous Katori Hall, whose imagination and genius created this show, and the incredibly criminally unsung Millicent Shelton. <laughs> so to meet our critics, we have Katia Woods from Philadelphia. Hi. Mercedes, oh, a different Mercedes <laughs> out of Atlanta. We have Thomasina, another Pennsylvania uh -huh. girl. Mr. Reggie Ponder from my hometown, Chicago. Hey, you guys. Hey. We have, oh, we have two Mercedes. We're overflowing in Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Another one. Well, Mercedes, you're in Pennsylvania as well? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh. Well, Pennsylvania, I'm in there. Sharonda, who is repping the ATL from the loop. We have Miss Carolyn Hines, who is in Toronto. We have Tamika Newhouse. Another ATL in. Hi. Then we have, um, well, I like to say the notorious KBG <laughs> out of NYC. We have Mr. Al McGee out of Florida. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Ray Cornelius in ATL. What's up? Hey. So without further ado, let's get it rolling, Katia. Hey, everybody. It's so thrilled to be here with you guys. My question is for Nico. Um, Uncle Cliff, it, he, Clifford is just a really, I think, important character for our community, especially as we are now with the intersection of not just affirming Black rights, but the rights of the LGBTQ community. And we're, we're learning and educating ourselves more about non-binary and what that means. And what do you want this character to portray and help our community to have this very important but at times uncomfortable conversation? Um, I think that the character, uh, Uncle Clifford, who prefers the pronoun she, I think that the, the conundrum of literally being called Uncle Clifford <laughs> and preferring the pronoun she and her, therein lies, um, Katori, you said the other day, therein lies the, the, the non-binary aspect of the character. I, I hope that this character really just sparks a lot of conversation um, within families. You know, it's great that it all, like when we go to the, that major, that massive space of society, society. But I think like to start literally just with your family, you know, I've had, um, since this show has aired, people literally just reach out talking about their sons, um, talking about, you know, members of their family that they're getting a greater understanding from, um, from seeing Uncle Clifford and people that are non-binary expressing that they're watching the show with their family and the things that the family hasn't been able to say to that person, they're able to say to the screen. I think sometimes mm -hmm. just we as a community, especially as Black people, there's so much, um, uh, I don't want to call it baggage, but there's just so much stuff that we carry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's so much that we are dealing with. I, I feel like oftentimes um, we are just getting to the space where we can kind of tackle identity. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's been a lot of other things along the way. So the, the consistency and the patience and the diligence that people are doing in terms of having these conversations is really, really, really powerful to me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy about that. I feel like when Uncle, if Uncle Clifford, if the men assist heterosexual, especially black men of a certain age, let's just say 50 and up, if they see in the gangster and the hustle and the heart of Uncle Clifford and can identify with the character that looks nothing like them and a world mm -hmm. so far that they were afraid of, if they are finding connective threads, chef's kiss. Thank I'm you. here for that. Hi everyone, I'm Mercedes out of Atlanta. First of all, congratulations to, to you all with P-Valley. It is starting a lot of different conversations. 
Um, my question is for Katari. Um, in writing this, I'm sure you wouldn't have known that we would be at this space right now where everyone's talking about the WAP music video and women owning their sexuality. Yeah, they are. You know? <laughs> um, but with P-Valley, you see the same duality of women owning their sexuality and doing what they have to do, but that echoing of the church in the background as well. So I was wondering, uh, Katari, how do you think that P-Valley contributes to the conversation as, that's on the larger scale now? I mean, it's interesting. I've, it, as we know, strip clubs have always existed. And we, we know that a lot of women have been able to participate in this exploitative space and yet gain a sense of liberation for themselves, whether it's, you know, financial liberation or just like, you know, liberation of the, you know, expression. And so um, the fact that now there's just so many things dovetailing, the fact that, you know, Cardi, ble Cardi B blew up when she did, um, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, set the stage for uh, the, the WAP, <laughs> which I was just like, I just saw it because everybody was on Twitter saying the WAP needs to be in the uh, in the next season, and I was just like, what is this video? Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so cool that you know it, it was the people who connected, you know, created that connective tissue between the the show and and um, you know just what female rappers are doing right now, and just you know women. Um, period, whether you you black or white, this this thing of not being ashamed of of your sexuality and and your body and and being okay with the jiggles the of of your bum bum and your and your and your boobies. It's um some people will say that it's a questionable empowerment. It's like how can you kind of embrace um uh, sexualization as a road towards freedom, but I really think it's just standing in in your power as a feminine woman and kind of um, in embracing all the things that make you a woman and being okay with that. You know, historically we've been uh, made to feel ashamed of of our bodies, um, of our hair, of, of, of it all, of our blackness. And, and so when I think of this intersectional um, place where you know black being black and being a woman collide I just think it's 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 we're in such a a revolutionary space right now particularly as a woman of color who is taking charge in and and telling those narratives and creating space for other black women whether they're they're actors or directors to kind of contribute their truth to something that should have been ours from from the jump like we are here we 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 are roaring, um, we are taking charge, and we can't be ashamed of the walk. You know, we can't be ashamed <laughs> of the walk. So um, I'm really excited to be at this moment and and to just be so so prescient and on the pulse. Um, but you know, I just feel like it's just conversations that have we've been having, but we've been having behind closed doors, and now you know it's on Black Twitter. <laughs> and everybody mm -hmm. has the same conversations at the same damn time. So, you know, I'm just real grateful. Thank you. Art reflects life. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Mercedes Williams, also known as the Movie Scene Queen out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and first of all, every Sunday I have a ritual. After I watch church online, I close the laptop and I say, uh, down in the valley where the girls get <laughs> Oh! <laughs> so my family knows, just leave me alone. I'm about to watch P Valley. I'll see y'all in about 45 minutes. Wow. Um, I want to thank you for the art, the creativity, just the expression of being able for a Black woman to be whoever she is, um, specifically when it comes to this show. My question is, with the reaction and the series still in motion and episodes being released every week, uh, what are you most surprised about the reactions or the reviews or the conversations on Black Twitter? This for everybody? This question? Yes, yes. Okay. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, you should. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think it's, it's, me and Nico were talking about this uh, one day, like looking at Twitter and looking at the Facebook conversations um has been so interesting it kind of reminds you of theater like we both come from the theater space and it's like sitting in the dark next to you know people watching your play and they're having this immediate response to it um and you know 
You can tell when somebody don't like your stuff, and then you know <laughs> when somebody like, oh my goodness, you know, there's the gasp, there's the laugh. And so I've just been really thankful that, you know, technology has allowed us to actually um, be sitting next to the people, mm -hmm. even though it's all virtual. And so um, what I have been the most surprised about is that, you know, folks have not been clowning us too much about, um, you know, uh, doing a show about bl black strippers. You know, we have this long history of hypersexualization of black women. And I think the reason why there hasn't been so many kind of attacks on the show is because I think we really did our jobs in terms of humanizing these women. Um, but the, the one conversation that I am tripping out about is the fact that people are mad about the accents. There's some yes. people <laughs> yes. that have been like, we don't talk like this. This is yes. the Y'all got us talking like slaves. And I literally was like, oh my God, they think I sound like a slave because that's actually how I talk sometimes. Um, <laughs> like it is literally the tongue that I grew up with. You know, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, my folks from Mississippi. And so the, the dialect slash accent slash slang, which we call slanguage, is so carefully crafted because it is so reflective of like, I'm almost 40 years old. Like this is 40 years on my ear and just as long on my tongue. So mm -hmm. I've been very surprised that um, people have felt shame and felt embarrassed by what I think is a beautiful form of communication. Um, and I think it's because this is the first time that we have ever seen this social group on, on premium cable in this elevated way, like Southern country, ghetto, like black as they is, like, and being who they are and not feeling any shame or, or any sense of a white gaze or a black gaze. Um, on, on, on them. And so that was, that's the thing that I was most surprised by because it's so literally dead on. And I, it's funny, I was flipping through Twitter and somebody was like, I, I, I taped myself, you know, talking because I was saying that the, um, uh, the language was offensive. And then he was like, I'm embarrassed. I actually do sound like that. So <laughs> it's the thing that we that's just funny. embrace that, you know, all black people talk differently. All yeah. Southern black people speak differently, and it ain't nothing wrong with saying now one or maiden or, or thriller or you know I'm finna go to the stove. Like I I went to Juilliard, Harvard, and Columbia, and I still say I'm finna go to the stove. So <laughs> say man. Go. yeah, I still say it. So it's um that's the one thing I've been most surprised by in terms of reaction. So, Can I tell you something that's really surprising? Is that I actually had a director who was one of the people who mentored me, he's probably 80 years old. And he sent me an email after he was watching the show. And he's like, I really want to talk to you about this world. I've never seen this world. I've never experienced it. And we had a conversation for 45 minutes just about the world that you created. So I, not only is it affecting the people who are a little familiar with the culture, but it's reaching out to people who are not. And, and I think that's a testament. I agree. I agree. Millicent, were you going to add on to like, what are you surprised about? Or is that what you're surprised about? That's what I'm surprised about. I mean, you know, when we, when we were making it, I said, people are going to either love it or they're going to hate it. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be yeah. anybody in between. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm happy that people love it. I really am. Yeah. Me too. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I, I was so prepared for so much hate, so much ridicule, so much like the pointing fingers, the na 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 that like I, my soul was fortified and ready, <laughs> you know. But I was like, this is true. This is what I know to be true. This is who I've seen in the world, um, and I wanted to like you know humanize um, the non-binary people that I have seen, not only in the world but that people are seeing online, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and take away just the joke. And, and the punchline and the, the comedy of it all, you know, um, I know that that's a way that you can get into our hearts is through the laughter, because that's right. how we can heal and deal with a lot of things and the uncomfortable. But I wanted to go beyond that. But I guess I would say I'm most surprised. 
I'm happy. I'm not surprised. I'm just proud of my people because for the most part, for the most part, I do hear the, the rumblings and the uncomfortability and stuff like that amongst the community. Um, but the love that's being shown mm -hmm. is really, really, really beautiful. And I feel like it's affirming, not me. It's not affirming me. Cause you know, I'm still here in my apartment by myself, but like people out in the world that are like same gender loving that are, have different levels uh, and of ex expression and identity. It's, it's really just really beautiful to see that, you know, and I'm happy to see the liberation like within black people talk about sexuality because we like so many different things, you know, to have my mother who is 70 talk about, I mean, why are they acting like something wrong with that? Who just lay there like that? How did they get a baby if you just lay there like, and I'm like, yes, mama, come on, show them how you do it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's just this idea of just submission, you know, and like, okay, have your way, you know, like Seely, you know, um, and we, we beyond that, we beyond that. Ain't nobody laying on top of you doing your business. Sometimes you gotta be, you know, I just, I like that conversation and, and having that out there. I feel like it's just really liberating in a lot of ways for a lot of people. So that's what makes me the most happy. I think the other thing I was surprised by was the uh, people were very surprised at the full frontal nudity of the men mm. in the show. And I think yeah, it, like, it, we were just like, well, if these women running around <laughs> right. naked, naked all the time, it's like the men got to be naked too when we can see right. them. We at the club and so that's that's their space and so they are going to be um, you know, naked. Uh, sometimes asshole naked. But um, we, we really, we have numerous conversations with the men about this idea of parody and yeah. if we were going to participate um in in this kind of you know disseminating these images of of uh of our women um in a sexualized manner it's like well the, the men have to um bear it all as well yeah. so mm -hmm. um uh, there has been a lot of applause i think <laughs> in regards to the full frontal nudity uh with the men uh, but there have been some people like i'm clutching my pearls and i'm like why we all got our birthday suits like <laughs> exactly exactly it's supposed to show you how unequal it's been when it comes to who gets naked on screen mm -hmm. and how we as a society are accustomed and programmed to oh we can see a woman's breasts or a man's chest and feel totally different i'm like it's the same you know, mm -hmm. there would be times that Uncle Clifford is walking around with no shirt on and they're like, oh my God. And I'm like, these are not titties. <laughs> 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 this is just a chest, you know what I mean? Like, get with it, you know? But I, I think it's interesting when people see that and you're confronted with those, those ideas, you know? But as a cast, we all talked about that, you know, constantly about if the women as men if women were going to be this open, we as men also had to be this open and vulnerable. The stories that we are telling about these characters really required us to be there in that yeah. space of, of, of vulnerability and literally just being stripped down. You're in a strip club, so that what better else place to be your most naked self? Thank you guys so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomasina. I'm out of Philly. I want to first say congratulations to you all. I love the show. Congratulations on the acclaim. Congratulations on it being picked up for a second season already. Um, and this question is for Nico, because you originated the character of Uncle Clifford on in the play. Um, I love Uncle Clifford. I think that she and Mercedes have some of the best one-liners. Um, and I want to know, are there any differences from the play to the small screen? Have you learned anything about the character? What's new? Um, Uncle Clifford constantly is revealing herself to me. It's the strangest thing. It's, it's, well, it's not strange. It's like you're living and it's like, oh, when you turn 35, you're like, oh, I don't do that no more, huh? <laughs> Why am I liking tomato soup? My granddaddy always used to eat tomato soup. Oh, Lord, I'm getting like my granddaddy. You know, like those, those kinds of revelations. Um, but from the play, when we first started with the, the, those pages back in 2009, all the way to now, I feel like Uncle Clifford, the difference, the main difference is the intimacy. Mm -hmm. And not the sexual intimacy. I'm not talking about that. I'm literally just talking about how you are able to experience her. Um, in the play, you know, we were confound to the club. So everything was in the pink. Um, and whether it was in the different rooms or whatever of the pink, but 
now that it's a TV show, you're able to, to see her full life outside of the club and see how she intersects with um, members of society and, and the community. Um, so that has been, that would be the most fresh. And what you're gonna see in episode six coming up, that, that, that component is a, that was in the back subtext in the play, but it was not actually played out. So you get to see, see that, that relationship with Clifford at home. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about filmmaking. You know, when you're in a theater, you're playing to the people in the back row and the people in the front row are still, yeah. what, like 20 feet away from you, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the wonderful thing about filmmaking is you get a camera and you get in and you get inside of the spirit and the soul of the, of the character. And what Katori was saying is making these characters being, you know, full-fledged characters. They're beyond, they're not stereotypes. They have spirit, they have history, they have, you know, depth and to be able to get a camera in there, you find out so much more about Uncle Clifford mm -hmm. and all of the characters. Yeah. And it, they are beyond just, I mean, that's why I think it's great. I mean, you did, I think that's why you're not hearing so much kickback that you're dealing with strippers is because we're, that we're dealing with people who have a job, <laughs> but what yeah. you're really dealing with is the soul of the folks, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago, and I'm, I'm, I have a question for uh, both Nico and uh, Katori. Um, the first thing I, I just have a comment is I, I just think you guys got it right. I, I think that the reason that you're getting the love that you're getting is that you got it right. And for Nico, uh, the, the character that, that you play can sometimes in other ways come off as... Um, as a, a character of someone, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you seem to come with such authenticity that that character spoke to me right away. I'm one of those 50 people and that's the character spoke to me right away. What mm -hmm. rules, since you got so many rules, what rules do you have that makes you come with such authentic, authenticity? And then I, I just want to ask um, uh, Katori, about uh, what what do you want men to take away from this other than the fact that we, we're talking about, oh, those strip performances are authentic. But anyway. Hmm. Good question. Uh, Katori, would you like to go first or me? Um, just what, what, what should men take away from the show? Um, it's interesting. I must say, I don't um, think about a message based on gender, even though um, I... I'm aware that, you know, women and men experience the strip club uh, world differently. Um, and, and, and women and, and men are customers in, in strip clubs. And I think a lot of people don't realize that women actually um, be throwing dollars sometimes. Um, but I, I think it's just for everyone, regardless of your gender, that these women are real. And these women are worthy of, of, of their story being told and, and this world is worthy of, of a very deep exploration because I always say that the strip club to me just stands for America. It's, it's just this big metaphor where there are people who be up on the pole and people trying to climb up and people trying to break through and dance on the ceiling and a lot of us can't. And mm -hmm. so, you know, regardless, you, you, you older, you're younger, you're a man, you're a woman, I think everyone can can be in that space and, and understand what it feels to, to struggle because all of us have different struggles and oftentimes those struggles mm -hmm. are based on, on different things. Sometimes it's based on racism, sometimes it's based on sexism, classism, all of that. And what's very interesting about not only the paint as a strip club, but also just the, the show in general is that we are really trying to explore this line between um, exploitation and, and empowerment. And, and, and the men who come into this space, sometimes they're, de they're dealing with disempowerment. Like it, it's very interesting that um, within this club, you, it doesn't really matter what your gender is, you can be on either side of the line. And so, um, while like I said, I don't think, you know, very specifically of a message for men, um, but I do think that men can, can take away uh, that these these women are hu are human beings, and that you know you know instead of throwing dollars at them, they they need to be learning who they are, like for real, for real, um, because that's where 
respect grows. And um, I think it's just been an amazing moment to, to see a lot of men, particularly online, um, give these women respect, especially when for so long, you know, it's always been like, oh, she a hoe, she a stripper. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna deal with mm-hmm. her. And it's like, no, nah, she ain't no hoe, baby. She a superwoman. I don't know what you talking about. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the, where we're leading the conversation. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I also think that, you know, people forget that that feeling that men and women have the patrons of the strip club that they have when they're throwing those dollars. You know, sometimes there's that, they're coming from whatever jobs they have and, and, and lifestyle, but sometimes when you're showering someone with that money, there's this feeling of being like this God, you mm-hmm. know, of some kind of empowerment, you know, and spreading of blessing. So I think that people can forget that that lesson there. But for, for me, Reggie, in terms of like a roof that, I go by for Uncle Clifford. I mean, she got so many doggone rules, you know, but I, <laughs> I would say that one, you know, to thine own self be true, mm-hmm. you know, um, because I didn't feel like, regardless of how many wigs Uncle Clifford had, what she was wearing, for me, it was literally like, how do I feel today? <laughs> That's literally just how I, the looks and all that, it was like, What do you feel like today? So sometimes I feel like the beauty of being black is that you can do many different things. You don't have to be stuck to one thing. I'm looking at this screen right now. I see locks, fro, fade, press. Mm -hmm. I see extensions. I see, do you understand? Like we do everything. So if you're in a dark place, put on a red wig. You know what I'm saying? Maybe that makes you happy. Just like That's brothers a quote. put on, exactly. <laughs> if you're in a dark place, put on a red wig forever. I will never <laughs> ever forget that. Millicent, I got my red wig too. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm just saying, it's no different from like when we would put on like some Argyle socks as opposed to the the, the black sheer Stacey Adams socks. You know what I'm saying? Back in the day, you you put on something a little more funky. You, you got a polka dot tie instead of the paisley tie. It's literally just how Uncle Clifford is feeling that day. So some mm-hmm. days you're going to catch her in a tracksuit and a, and a do-rag, and some days you're going to catch her in some Tim's and, and, and a little move something dress. You know what I mean? You just, <laughs> you feel it sexy, you feel it you just do what you do. <laughs> and I, I feel like, you know, that was the, that was the, the, the starting point. Thank you so much. Hey, it's KB here, um, NYC by way of Houston. Um, so first off, just thank you guys so much for this incredible show. I mean, honestly, I loved every episode. I feel like it's such nuanced storytelling and the directing is just top notch each episode. Um, hey, Millicent. Yeah, so, um, my question is for Millicent. Um, so tell me a little bit more about kind of the technical triumphs and challenges of showcasing these women and all of their glory and power and really kind of shifting that visual narrative of sex workers. Um, and then also, what was your favorite scene uh, to direct in episode three? Oh, Lord. <laughs> There's a lot of favorite scenes. <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the things is when I originally met with Katori, it was it, we really were focused on telling, being truthful and humanizing these characters. So I, I actually spent time at the strip club. Did I tell you I went to the strip club? I was a little traumatized. But. I was there with you. <laughs> <laughs> a little traumatized. But what, what in, in regards to the actual dance, I was amazed at the athleticism of them. And so we got together with the choreographer and we really, really wanted to highlight that. You know, it's that they're, they're workers that this, what they do is, yes, it's sexual, but it's freaking amazing. And so instead of what you had normally seen, like when you looked at strippers, you would look at um, like in the Sopranos or in the background and it's just naked women and just like kind of writhing. Um, and we wanted to show that they are more than that and that they're amazing and they're strong and the strength is actually reflected in their personalities and the spirit that they have and the drive to overcome. So we really wanted to show the athleticism and, and, and blow it up. And I think we succeeded in that, in that my favorite dance was when they did that drop from the ceiling head down. I was in the back of the room with the choreographer. We were screaming like little girls and high-fiving each other and running up. We were like, do that shit! It was just freaking amazing. It was crazy. 
But then um, what I also love are the quiet moments, the quiet moments with the characters and getting inside and being able to, we have such an amazing cast and to get inside their eyes and, and feel the soul and the spirit. And that was the other thing. Um, there's a couple of wonderful scenes. You know, uh, the one where you find out that Mercedes has a daughter and she's having an argument. I mean, you know, Brandy really dug deep and opened herself up and you found out so much about there's a layer. You know, when you walk into a store and order groceries, you know, you don't know what's going on in the life of that teller. And it's the same as this, you know, this woman who's a stripper. There's so much more to her than what you see that's in front of you. And, and that's truthfully what's important, you know. And dealing with Autumn Night, she's got so many layers. She's got so much. And so she's such, she's such an interesting character. And to just get in just a little bit. You know, when you find out the pain that's involved with the loss of her child, you don't know everything that's going on, but you know the pain. And to know that there's, there's, I want to know more about this character. And Uncle Clifford, my favorite scene, my favorite shot is you standing as that big old ring is coming. Can I tell you, <laughs> you're out in the middle of a field on a plantation and the AD was like, Wilson, you get to stop the rig and put your hand down and, and the driver's gonna stop. And Nico's standing there, all beautiful. I'm on a little apple box sweating like crazy. There's piles of manure around me, right? <laughs> and the thing is coming and it's coming and it's coming. And Amy's like, Millicent, Millicent, Millicent. I was like, it's okay. And Nico's like, he's like, Millicent, Millicent. He goes, I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> it's like, Millicent. And I went, stop. And it stopped, woo, right in front. Can I tell you, he did not budge. And to the bottom of my heart, I thank you for trusting me. Because that, oh, was, yeah. that was trust. <laughs> he knew I was not going to let him get run over. And he stayed there and it stopped right in front. And it was, the, it was the best moment. But what my favorite part of that scene is, is when you're talking to Corbin and you're, 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 it's the, it's the, the, you're caressing him with your eyes. And it felt like there's so much more to that, there's so much depth and there's so much more texture to that relationship, just in the way that you played it and the way that you talked to him. And I loved it. It's one that, of was your, all your, that was all your directing. And, and ah, no. I was like, remember, I was like, guys, we're in this cotton field. I feel like, let me get some cotton. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna slap him with some cotton. <laughs> I was like, no. I was like, no, don't do no, that. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. That was that was definitely a moment for real, for real. Well, thank it was you a, so much. It was a it was a moment to let all of you just shine. You know, there's there's so much intensity, there's so much story there, and there's so much character. And really, in in cases, less is more because the, it's so rich in material that Katori has crafted that you don't have to do much. You just need to let them shine and give them a place to do it and a safe a safe space. I, I, I want to add on to that, Millicent, like having women and Black women around um, as an actor and in this space, it felt like home. And, you know, mm -hmm. we have a very theatrical theater company kind of a vibe on our show. But it, for me, being raised, both my parents are in my life, um, but being raised primarily by my mom, having a woman, somebody, you don't even know, God, out here that could sit and say, you don't need to do that because there's something coming in six that you're gonna, that the, like there was, there was directing of the moment and of the story. So I, as an actor, you always felt supported because you had mama over here, the creator, the visionary, she knew all authority on all of these people in her world. I'm talking about you, Katori. And then we had, <laughs> <laughs> we had Millicent Mama over here who knew literally what was in her head. She knew how things were gonna be cut because there would be things I was like, well, I want, I need to go, I've cut before you, you don't need to worry about that. Just <laughs> tell me this part right here. And I was like, sure, you know, <laughs> it, it left, it left, you as an artist to be able to be just so open so in terms of women and especially black women having the space to to really advocate for their their vision and their dreams and trusting that was really secondary second nature to me you know but I think sometimes in a workplace 
it gets shifted because at home you listen to everything that mama say mm -hmm. at home husband is listening to everything that wife say you know or supposedly if he want to be happy but you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah. you know so when it shifts into the workspace there was something that sometimes i mean experience that happens where like these black women have to be extra tough and assert themselves yeah. and i was like wait no 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 stop she ain't said nothing yet mm -hmm. go ahead now what were you saying you know so all of us have to be allies for each other yeah. in creating the space for that to happen because we can if you're opening your eyes you can see when that disrespect is coming and it's like no stop that stop that this mm -hmm. is to know what she's talking about let her rock thank you for that oh i, I know we it. um have a lot of people who did haven't gotten the chance to go so i know that i can stay on a little bit longer um i can too it, okay, just to, I want to make sure that everyone at least has an opportunity to ask, you know, a question. Um, so uh, we'll just make, I'll make sure I keep my, my, my answers. And I'll condense. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We, yes, we, we love talking about our show. Uh, <laughs> Y'all haven't, you know, I haven't had a chance to see Millicent in a while, so it's just like, it's nice to be on. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jeronda Williams from Pay Your Weight. Um, I do have a question for Nico. So one of the things that I find so fascinating about Uncle Cliff is um, when you see her, she's very confident and very strong and knows exactly, you know, what she wants, what she needs, and what has to be done. Um, but specifically, um, you see a, a other side to Uncle Cliff where there's this uncertainty or sometimes it comes off the shame. And we see that first when um, Uncle Cliff has to go and try to buy a little bit more time so we don't lose the pink. But also, too, what we saw in this week's episode where we see Uncle Cliff kind of staring um, at herself in the mirror and doesn't really feel who she is until that wig comes on. And so I wanted you to speak a little bit more kind of, of the internal battle that is happening with Uncle Cliff. And also, too, um, even from a writing standpoint, if you guys can share what's to come with Uncle Cliff later on in the season. That's really cool. I have heard a lot about that moment. It's, I find it really interesting. I think, for me, I think that people can are putting their own <laughs> experiences on the moment. You know, because that's how we view things. You know, you're viewing it from your from your experiences as well. But internally, there is no shame um, that's going on with Uncle Clifford. I actually, in that moment, I I wasn't even looking at my body. I was looking at Little Murder in the mirror. Um, so it literally was just about, wait, what's happening? This it was more of a clutch of a pearl. It's like, ooh, you didn't did this. Oh, this was a lot. Ooh. <laughs> Let me get. It. And then I hear, I, 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 I getting it together and you hear, what's that noise outside? And hearing Lauren, the jukebox, um, the divorce day from this episode, that's what um, like broke the moment for me. Like, let me get out of here. Let me not deal with this. And I'll come back. In my mind, I was coming back. But once I found out that the club was, was 14 days, I gotta go. Mercedes gone, wait, huh, huh. like it's just so much. And I, I think that like, there's just so much that Cliff is going through in terms of the club, the people that are, are, are relying on the club for their livelihood, romance going, all of it was like, wait, what? It was kind of like a, a short cricket. And I think what you can look forward to on the back uh, end of the season is just more humanization of Uncle Clifford and um, digging deep into that relationship, this blossoming relationship between her and La Murda. Um, it's, it's, it's surprised a lot of people um, and I, in a good way. And so I'm really excited to see um, our audience go on that journey because I think it, it's, a, it's gonna be a turning point um, for Uncle Clifford and for La Murda. Hi, this is Carolyn in Toronto. Um, so my question is for both Melissa and Katori. And it has to do with the theme of the show being is stripping, right? We know that it take a lot of it takes place in the strip club, but for me, a lot of the um, moral and ethical themes and also the emotional themes is about stripping away. And one of the things that I find really interesting is there's these very quiet moments when the girls are up on the pole and everything goes quiet and you just hear them deep breathing. And you realize and like for the for the for the men and the women in the audience, they're like, oh, these women are so fantastic and they're moving so effortlessly, but you hear them, and you're like, they're struggling and they're 
they're pushing their, their spouse to the limit to hold on. And then there's also the, the parts where they strip away when they go into the back room to change and you see who they really are. They're no longer performing. And then there's the other aspect with the church. I found it really interesting how you reveal how political church is and how like sexism mm -hmm. and patriarchy is still very much present in the church and how there's the performance in the front with the singing and the preaching. And in the back, there's the, there's the, the, the shenanigans and the backstabbing. And I wanted to ask you about how you plotted those, those particular those particular moments to make sure that it was all this one big um, through line that, that went through the show. Um, number one, I just had an amazing writer's room <laughs> because I came in with all these ideas and like, I, I think it's so interesting that, you know, yes, the, the show is a, about the strip club world, about strippers, but it's really about black women who just happen to be strippers. And so as a black woman, you know, a Southern black woman, I have had to deal with all of those isms, right? The, the, the racism, sexism, classism, all of it, even, you know, on my own damn job. And so I felt that the trajectory of both her mom, uh, Woodbine, uh, Mercedes and her mom, um, really needed to feel like they, they were uh, kind of almost on the same journey. The fact that you know, both of them are, are trying to claim a pedestal, like, you know, Mercedes is trying to uh, claim respect for herself um, in the world, and then her mom is trying to, you know, get, get the pulpit, you know, and, and get respect for herself in the church, and it's just so interesting that her mom basically, um, you know, uh, acted as, as a man, right? <laughs> and and mm -hmm. really took control over her and manipulated her and, and stole from her stole stole her dream away um and i always said that you have to make a villain understandable and yeah. so the fact that she was pushing up against the patriarchy in the black church which a lot of us know about and a lot of us have seen but we don't talk about that now because that's taboo that's dirty laundry but this show is all about you know putting panties on the line so um it 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 was a really great way to um, use the character of Patrice Woodbine um, a, as a way to kind of dig into what is a very complicated truth when it comes to um, not only the black church, but all churches. Like I think about, you know, yeah. um, the uh, Catholicism. I don't think they can't, women can't be priests there, right? So um, it's, it's kind of a, a universal thing, the, the fact that these two women, even though they're kind of foes, are still battling um, the big Goliath of patriarchy. And I think one of the things visually that um, happens when we started filming it is that w the performances are all the glitz, the glamour. A lot of times there's slow motion and you really take in the, it's the sexiness, the sexualness, but it is the athleticism of there, but we're more standoffish, you know? And then when we go backstage, it's more, this less slow motion. You're more grounded, real, you're with them. So you get to see that, Oh, out there, that's the performance. That's, that's, that's when the shield is up. And when you come backstage, that's when they're truly stripped down. And visually, it actually reflects that in the way that the show is shot. Hi guys, Mickey Newhouse here out of Atlanta. I wanna kind of piggyback off of the last um, question when it goes to the dancers being on the pole and we can actually hear their breathing, we can hear their heartbeat. There are a lot of layers of emotion throughout the whole entire series. And um, as one of the, the screeners that stars kind of sent an access link, I would like to recommend that they give us the whole season, by the way. Um, so I just want to kind of put that out there. It's interesting. Um, I some people got the whole, um, I think some people did get the whole thing. So I think- Oh, it was, wait, I didn't get it. Cause, cause they I never, I, <laughs> next time, girl, you got to ask for what you want. You know what? You're absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, but first, bravo for all the different layers of emotion throughout every single episode. I'm very interested in um, the triggers that this may have placed on some of the actors mm -hmm. um, as far as real life traumas or real life experiences. I felt like I wasn't watching actors. I felt like mm -hmm. I was really watching the real people going through these emotions, especially Nico, you would, um, Uncle Clifford. I mean, I, I had an, a, a cousin that was identical to that character. So it was kind of surreal watching her. Um, so I wanted to, were there any triggers um, 
that the characters have to kind of push through? And if so, how did you, uh, Millicent, I guess it's for you kind of get them into that space um, to really show those raw emotions? Well, you know, in, in anything that's, I think as a director, when you approach working with actors, you know, um, some like to tell you what they're experiencing, like personally, others like to just deal with the character. And I respect either method of acting. I'm there to help facilitate and to give them a safe place and to allow them to express what's needed for the character or for the human being to express themselves. So I look at every scene, find out what the heart of it is and try to talk and communicate with in the language that works for that actor to figure out how to, how for he or she to be able to open up and uh, elicit the emotion that's appropriate for the scene. So I don't really get it. Sometimes they'll tell me that, oh, I had this experience, but honestly, not, sometimes you're just looking at really amazing actors that take, that get to the heart of an emotion. And it's not that they've been in that same situation, but they link in and connect to, I understand this emotion and I, and I, and I have to figure out how do I bring it to life? How do I service the character? to bring it through me. And as a director, I make them feel safe. We talk about it, we get to the understanding, and then we just let it all flow. One of those triggers for me um, was in episode three, when the Trinity dance is happening, um, and Uncle Clifford is on the mic emceeing. And because we were filming and the stunt of these women and, and the, the surfboard, the upside down with the literally Trinity on that pole, there's technical things that are happening with the camera crew going around and the, you know like they are the camera crew is dancing with the dancers yeah. as well to get inside the dance you know and i remember in at one point millicent was like if millicent was on her god mic it's like keep going nico keep going clifford keep going <laughs> and and the the dialogue just kept coming and that was a trigger for for me back because i grew up in detroit and it was just like party. Like I, I just went into like party mode and, okay. and it was a full on, we weren't in a club. Like it was real in my mind. You know what I'm saying? It so felt it like a club. <laughs> <laughs> Ray Cornelius here out of Atlanta. My show is up front inside Atlanta's entertainment industry. Congratulations, Katori, Nico, and Millicent on an amazing show. I too, mm -hmm. like Mercedes, I watch um, Sunday best, then I go to the shy, and then we end it with <laughs> Pete Valley. First, like, I go from being I a safe to a sinner <laughs> all in one night. Um, <laughs> I want to know, Katori, um, these characters are so believable and so likable. When I think of the show, I often think about how relatable um, the characters from Pose are to what we've experienced in real life. And I, I call that show a show about American history. And I would say the same thing about um, P-Valley, that this is a show about American history. Where, who inspired these characters and this story? I know that it comes from a play, but because they're so relatable, who were you thinking about when you created these characters? And then I also have a question for Nico as well. I think first and foremost, a lot of the characters are based off of my family. Like a lot of people are always like, why is Uncle Clifford so like, you know, like a bullseye? Like, like it just, everyone's like, I know Uncle Clifford. I know Uncle Clifford. I'm like, well, because Uncle Clifford is based off of my mama, my daddy, and my Uncle Clifford. Yeah. And what's so interesting is that even Uncle Clifford's like, wait a minute, you done made me a pimp punk. And I'm like, ain't hey, nobody, that's not you for real, for real. It's just like a little bit of you. A little bit because it's like this um fusion and that's what i do with like i think all of my writing i'm so inspired by real life and because i haven't seen folks that look like me and talk like me and talk about like family on screen in such an elevated way i really wanted to um make this like a a, a love letter to them mm -hmm. and 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 to the south specifically um, being from Me Memphis, I always call it Memphis Sippy because it's right there uh, in Mississippi, so we might as well be there. Um, but yeah, I it's it's just all the people that I've ever met in this this little life of mine have found a way inside of a lot of the characters. Like a lot of people, um, they they look at the mayor and they was like, "This mayor, you know, played by uh, Isaiah Washington, this mayor." 
like he so the stuff that he said i'm like well my daddy says stuff like that <laughs> 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 and so um yeah and then you know i did a lot of research and i interviewed over 40 women and i met a lot of mercedes in the in, over my six years of interviewing um women and it's just been so interesting to be inspired by uh, those those real life um, dancers, and and they have themselves, their souls have found their way inside of the characters as well. So it's based off um, all the characters are based off a lot of research and a lot of living. And one one more question, Nico. Just wanted to know, or if you can take us to the um, the table reads. Are, when do you find out what your character is going to do next? Because I'm I'm sure you're sitting there like he's about she's about to do what I'm I'm about to do this. When do you find out about what's happening next for your character? Uh, if the table read was like on a Monday or a Tuesday, I mean it wasn't. Yeah, it was always was it Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? I don't remember. It was one of them days. Have a week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, right? Um, but pretty much, like, just over the weekend. <laughs> like, I didn't... <laughs> right before the table like, read you know, is what I'm telling you. <laughs> so I was like, oh, here we go. This is what we're doing today. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like I knew for the whole series or anything like that. Um, and it it worked. I did, it, it was very different than, like, crafting a play, where in the play, you know the entire arc. So you can craft this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment. Every, I felt like every episode is a movie, you know? So it was just literally, my job was literally, what am I doing in this moment? That's mm -hmm. her job to figure out all that other stuff, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's Millicent's job to like craft it. <laughs> so I was in my lane as an actor, I could always, you know, and, and working with Katori, she's so smart. She would ask little questions every now and again. Well, what would happen if, like, you ever did the da ba da ba da ba da? You know, I ain't gonna be, you just talking and you eating, you know, you eat. She's crafty <laughs> like that. <laughs> yep. oh. And she'd be like, <laughs> and you, <laughs> mix that with a little bit of imagination, and boom, there you go, you know. So, but I would just find out just before. So, there wasn't a lot of premeditation on it. It was about literally just being in a moment. That, but all of the backstory for the character was already there, you know, I definitely had the privilege from having the years uh, and crafting this character from the ground up and things like that, you know, for me, even just having my beard, like that just said a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys, and congratulations again. Thank, Thank you. Hi, I'm Al McGee with your entertainment ticket. And I'm here in Florida from Chicago, but I will admit in the 90s and early 2000s, I was a big fan of the uh, strip clubs. But there's a difference between the white strip clubs and the black strip clubs. This is for you, uh, Millicent. When you are uh, putting this together in Qatar, when, when you, you all was putting this together and got the script, did you also see those differences in different strip clubs as you started to put this together? Well, I mean, that's Katori. She wrote specifically to uh, a specific type of black Southern strip club. And we were shooting in Atlanta. And I, some of the dancers were from Magic City, right? Yeah. 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 Some of the our four dancers. And somebody was from Peaches. Yeah. Yeah. And and in Atlanta, the style of dance is, is, is that it's like, I keep saying it, but it felt like Cirque du Soleil to me. When we went up there, they were even crazier than what we showed on the show. I mean, the girls would climb up the pole with one leg up and be twerking, and their feet were on the seat, and I would just be like, oh, oh, oh my God, how do, how do they, how do they do that? I had never seen stripping like that before. So for me, it was um, just an appreciation of the art form and to show it in all of its splendor and all of its glory. I mean, that's how I approached it. But the world was created by Katori. And I, I visited over 40 clubs and I visited mm -hmm. all types of clubs, like uh -huh. clubs up north, clubs down south, white clubs, you know, black clubs, uh, Latina clubs. Um, and there's just something about a black Southern strip club. There's just something, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an experience. Yeah. So I, and I wanted to give that to um, the world because it did, like Millicent said, it, it always felt like Cirque du Soleil. I, I, it's kind of like just being a black woman in general. Like we always work a little bit harder. <laughs> 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 the 
so <laughs> <laughs> bring a face that man what well, <laughs> yeah thank yeah you guys so much thank you guys so well, much for joining us as you know we have to get to um key valley part two so we at afka are just overjoyed and we love to see more content for us and by us so thank you all for joining us and do know that the African American Film Critics Association will always support you in any way that we can. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much you for having us. It's go so Congratulations, good to see you guys. guys. Bye. It was. This Bye. Was really great. Bye. 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 Bye.